come up here if she wouldn't mind. In just a moment, we got something we want to say to you. Um, last Sunday, you all did a pastor appreciation thing for us, and um, I don't know what to say. Um, thank you. It, it just all blessed us more than we deserve. And, uh, you know, with all the attention going on about, you know, with helping with medical bills and all that stuff, I just wanted to want you to know I never wanted to be that guy. You know, I, I like to be the one to, to help others. I never wanted to be the one. I was getting all the attention. Well, don't get me wrong. I do like some attention. <laughs> but, but it's got a little bit over the top. And, um, and so I don't know what to say, but your love is... Something uh, special, unique. 
And He has a calling on each and every one of our lives. And He created us to do something and to be something according to His plan. And uh, sometimes we have a tendency to fight against that. I don't know if any of you have ever done that, but I've had a tendency to do that a time or two in my life where either I didn't know that God had a plan for me. When you're at that point, it's a little different. Somebody's got to make you aware that God has been kind of like that wild horse. It, it may not realize that it has a plan uh, that has been lined out for it to be, be a good horse, something that somebody can ride and enjoy or work cattle on or show or whatever. And, um, but it may not know that until you run that thing into that narrow gate and start getting its attention. And uh, we know what the Bible says, we're going to read it here in just a moment, but my goal through this series is to help us to understand that God has a plan for each of us. And we may have to yield to that pressure that God is putting on us, getting us to that place that He wants us to be, not only so that we can be a benefit and a glory to Him, but guess what? It's going to be a benefit to you too. And it will be a blessing to you too. Because God uh, creates us to do things that not only benefit Him, but benefit us. Well, sometimes we just have to let Him get our attention. So, let's go ahead and read. I'm going to read the same text that I read last week out of Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, uh, in verse 13. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that this message tonight, Lord God, would just go forth as you've intended it to. Lord God, it's, it's about you. And I pray that you would get our attention, Lord, and if need be, put a little pressure on us, then release it, a little more pressure until we get the idea of what you want us to be. So, Lord God, we submit ourselves to the preaching of the Word and listening. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us individually. Lord, I, I believe that just being here in this atmosphere opens the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives, even if it's not something that's said by the preacher. We thank you for that, Lord. And we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, I'm just going to read what I have in my notes here so I don't get sidetracked too much right here at the beginning. But, but I believe that this is a, is a powerful uh, passage of Scripture that causes us to ask the question, do I want to be forced into a small area or do I want to be allowed to roam where I'm free to do my own thing? What do I want? Well, most of us say I'd rather be free and allowed to do my own thing. But I'm thinking of my four beautiful grandkids here. And every now and then, my daughter and, and her husband have to get on to them. Um, grandparents don't do that too much. But, but the parents have to. Because if they're allowed to just do their own thing the way they want to do it, then they'll just end up being rotten. And, uh, and we don't like that, do we? No, as a matter of fact, Nathan and I, I was listening to a conversation he was having with his mom this week, and, and uh, it had to do with a, uh, I don't know, some kind of a game or something that he'd come up with, and, and uh, she was trying to explain, because they had gotten a little, and the kids had kind of got a little upset with each other, and, and so she was trying to explain to him that sometimes you've got to do what your, your brother or your sister wants to do, and sometimes you get to do what you want to do. And he said, but I want to do what I want to do. And besides that, he said, I'm the one that made the rules up. <laughs> kind of like that. He's four. He said exactly like that. But that's what he said. I mean, and in his mind, it was perfectly logical. He made up the rules and he wants to do it his way. I mean, it just makes sense. And, and that's a kind of the way we are, I think, in life a lot of times. And kind of the way that wild horse is. You know, just let me room, roam. I made up the rules. Leave me alone. Let me do what I want. But that may not be the best thing for you. Sometimes we need to allow the Lord to work in our lives a little bit. I believe that Matthew chapter 7 is a lot about what, we're, what we were created to be and not uh, what we just want to be. And, uh, and I believe that these things can be two different things. Sometimes they can be the same. 
Sometimes the thing you want to be is what God created you to be. God will plant that in your heart and you will want to do it. It works out pretty good. But then there are times when God wants you to do something that's not necessarily what you want to do. And you've got to make a decision. Am I willing to do the things God has asked me or do I just want to do my own thing? Um, I remember, you know, we used to ask kids a lot. Sometimes we still do. Uh, we say, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's kind of the, the, the question. And most kids will tell you something. They'll tell you, you know, they want to be a nurse or a fireman or a cowboy or maybe a ninja warrior or, you know, a teenage mutant ninja turtle or something. And, and uh, I remember one time we were pastoring a church in Meeker, Colorado, and, and, uh, and I thought it was cute because I asked this little boy, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he says, I want to be an archaeologist. I go, whoa, well, that's pretty awesome. His dad happened to be an archaeologist, thank you for where he got that from, and, and I don't know, he was about, what, three or four years old then, something like that, and his name was Philip, and, and so I thought, well, this is a great idea, I'm going to get a bunch of kids together, and get them up in front of the church, and I'm going to go down the line, I'm going to ask them what they want to be, and all these kids will be saying these silly things, and I'll get to Philip, and he'll say, I want to be an archaeologist, and that'll really be awesome, and so, so I get them up there, and I'm asking these kids, well, what do you want to be when you grow up, and, and I get to Philip, and I said, what do you want to be when you grow up, and he says, I don't know. <laughs> If you want to turn on to Psalm 139, uh, there's a passage there that uh, maybe we should be teaching our kids what, uh, what God wants them to be instead of just asking them all the time what they want to be. Uh, when we go over to uh, Psalm 139, verse 14, there's an amazing passage of Scripture here. It says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. I want to stop right there for a second. Um, you see, God is saying, and, 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 and the psalmist David is reiterating this to us, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are created by the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I want you to know something tonight. God don't make no junk. He only makes good things. And so this is a way we can begin to teach our children from the very beginning. Begin to read these scriptures to them and teach them that, that we want them to be what God created them to be. Not necessarily just what they want to be. It goes on to say in verse 15. It says, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me, then as yet, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me say that a little better. The days fashioned for me, when as yet um, uh, there were none of them. In other words, God has prepared for us uh, the way that he wants us to go even before we were born. He's prepared a plan for us. He has a perfect will for us to be involved with. And then he goes on in verse 17, the psalmist David says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And, and so what David is saying, that he's saying, I think God likes me. I think God created me to be something good, and it's awesome that God thinks about me. Now, there are billions of people on the face of the earth, and we think, well, that God must be getting confused from time to time with all those people. Well, I don't know how he does it, but even with billions of people on the face of this earth, he still cares about you. He still cares about me, personally and individually, and he has a perfect plan, and I want to be a part of that. Sometimes God has to get my attention in ways that, you know, I don't always like. You know, it's, it's better if you just give in right off the bat. Because things will be easier for you. As he will get your attention. Trust me, my wife has a, a, a saying that she says, is, it's a whole lot better to humble yourself before God than for him to humiliate you. <laughs> That's right. Well, praise the Lord. 
Well, last week we talked about um, verse 1 and 2. Don't judge someone else's eternity. Don't judge the final product of a man. We're all on a journey, and we need to uh, help each other along that journey, not be a hindrance. We talked about in verses 3 through 5, don't judge someone compared to yourself. Our goal should be to make sure that we're where we need to be in the eyes of God, not in our own eyes. And we should help others then be that as well. But tonight, we're going to continue uh, leading this wild horse into the narrow gate by, by learning a, a few more principles. So if you could just picture uh, training a horse and how, you know, it's pressure and release, pressure and release, and uh, until you eventually get them to the place to where they realize, hey, I really am a horse, and this is really what I'm supposed to do. It's awesome when you see them get it. And some of you have worked with horses, you've trained horses, and, and there's that point of connection and that point where it's just like you see the light bulb come comes on, and, uh, and they're like, yeah, that's pretty awesome, and then they do it, and, and they keep doing it, and they like it. You know, most horses I know like to be horses, and, you know, I've never come up with a horse yet that said, I don't want to be a horse, I'd rather be a cow. <laughs> I've never heard a horse say that. They like being who they are, because God created them to be that way. God created us to be people, to be uh, amazing products that he has a plan for. He didn't create us to be a horse. He created us to be his beautiful and wonderful creation. So I want to look at a few things. Let's go down to verse 6 in this passage. Verse 6 says, Don't give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. So when we take a look at it, we say, well, how, how is this making me into what you want me to be. So much of the time, when we read Scripture, especially things like that, we have people that come to our minds. And we think, well, I'm not going to give them anything good because they'll just trap one. And, we, and, and it t seems that we tend to, to gravitate quickly to the negative or to the bad. Instead of saying, well, what does this mean to me? How does this, how does this help me to be more like God? And so as I begin to study this passage of Scripture with that same question in mind, I said, Lord, you know what? What does this work? And how does this work? And, and the phrase that came to my mind was, don't force the gospel. You know, the old cowboy way was to uh, snuff the horse down, throw it down the sack over its eye, get that thing saddled, get somebody in the saddle, and break that horse. Break its will, break its spirit, until that horse figured out that it had to do what you wanted it to do. And, uh, and most of the time, horses like that were put in a remuda, and, and, uh, and you would have to go out, and you'd have to catch that horse, because all their hind ends were turned to you. And uh, that's just kind of the way it worked. And so the cowboys would go out, and all the horses' hind ends, and they'd have to rope the horse, pull it out of the, out of the pack, get that thing saddled, and that horse lived a lot of its life doing what it was forced to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really want to live my life like that. I don't want to get up every morning and say, great, I'm forced to live this life. I want to live this life because I want to, because I learned this is what I was created to. I told you last week about how when we were training the horses, we trained them that the safest place for them to be was their head right here in our chest. It's a whole lot easier to catch a horse when they're facing you. It's a whole lot easier to put a halter on a horse when they're facing you. And, uh, and we would teach them to put their head down. And, and my horse, Izzy, it, it's a lot of fun because you get the halter out and, and you hold it and he puts his nose down and the halter kind of helps you, you know. And, uh, and that's a whole lot better than to try to force that thing into doing something. And so we learn that we can't force the gospel on people. I can't stand here tonight and beat you over the head with the gospel and then have you say, boy, that was great. I think I'll do what he said. No, probably you won't come back. If I did that. So simply put, it doesn't do any good to keep telling somebody something that they absolutely reject. And there are people in this world right now that you so desperately want them to come to know Jesus. And so you do anything you possibly can to try to force them into, into calling them. And I, I mean, uh, it could be your husband or wife. You're leaving them notes. You're putting things under their pillow. You know, you pour oil on them while they're sleeping. You, you know, you, you leave your Bible open on the kitchen all right across their plate. I don't know. Whatever it is that, that you're trying to do, you're trying to force somebody to say, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. And what you find most of the time is that the more you push those kind of things, the more they reject it. It's the same way with the wild horse. The more you push that thing, the more it's going to reject. But if you give opportunity, 
Show love, show compassion, show concern. Pretty soon they'll come around and then they'll be ready to receive. This passage of scripture is saying that the things of God are holy. They're priceless. They're like pearls. They're like, like, like treasure with, with a great price that you can't, you can't put on because they're, they're so valuable and amazing. And sometimes we take the things of God and just beat people with it thinking that, that it's going to work. You know, if, if somebody doesn't get it, it'll be like, like these pigs. You throw them pearls, they'll trap them in the mud, and, and then they'll turn and rend you. And it doesn't do any good. You need to begin to pray. Pray for people. You know, I, I've said many times that uh, if you have a grandma praying for you, watch out. God's going to get you. Because those prayers of grandmas, man, they are something else. They're powerful. And, uh, and God listens to grandmas. And uh, grandmas make a difference in people's lives. And so you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you say, God, somehow, someway, open up that opportunity. God, uh, open up their hearts. Lord, uh, it, open and send someone they'll listen to, or something like that. Just begin to seek the Lord. But you can't beat them over the head with the gospel. Because it won't do any good. Pray for an opportunity. Wait until they're ready. The word of God and his truths are extremely valuable, but only to someone that can see it. And so I think that's what God is telling us. He says, I've created you to represent me to the world. But I didn't create you to beat people up. You know, I, I, I've read a lot about, um, about Jesus and how he went about his ministry. The only people he beat up was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He called them names. Call them a bunch of snakes, white horse sepulchers full of dead men's bones, boy, that'll get you. <laughs> but to, because he knew that they wouldn't receive the gospel. But to those that would receive, he went after the worst of the worst, the most vile sinners. Even the lady that was caught in adultery that day and ordered a stone, and he said, Wait, wait. And he began to talk about sin. He said, those of you with, uh, without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone in. And, uh, and they walked away. And he said, where are your accusers? And she said, I guess they're not here. And you know what he said? He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. She was ready. She received. The woman at the well. The woman with the issue of blood. I mean, you could go on and on and on and, and read about those that were ready to receive. Those that weren't, well, you know, he just waited until they were. Well, so that's one way that we can allow God to, to use us. Don't, don't immediately turn to the negative when somebody doesn't receive something you have to say. Say, you know what? Maybe I need to pray a little bit more for them. Pray that God will open up that opportunity. And when he does, you be ready because you don't want to miss those opportunities. Well, let's go on to this next uh, passage and then uh, we'll wrap it up with this tonight. Uh, it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find not and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. This could also be read this way. Pray, pray, and pray some more. Then trust, trust, and trust some more. You could, you could read it that way. But as you look at this passage, the first part we see here is ask. If you have any kind of a need, you need to go to the Lord, and you need to ask. Ask as if you need help. Now, most of us have that little element of pride. We don't like to ask for help. But God wants us to. God wants us to go to Him with every single need that we have. And He wants us to ask. You keep asking. You say, well, well I asked Him twice and nothing happened. Ask some more. Keep on asking. God will listen. God will hear. Sometimes I think God has said to me, you know, I'll ask him two or three times and nothing will happen. I'll ask some more times and nothing will happen pretty soon. I feel like God is saying to me, how bad do you really want this? You know, are you just wanting me to be a fairy godfather here or, or do you really have a need? And, and, uh, and God helps me with that. Secondly, it says seek as one looking uh, for an item of great value that you must have. When you're seeking the things of God, Seek it as though it's something you've got to have. 
You want the, the everything that God has for you. You want the very deepest things He has. You want, you want as much grace and as much faith and, and as much goodness, as much understanding of God that you can possibly have. Seek as though it's the, the most precious, most valuable thing that you can possibly acquire. That's what He's saying. Seek for those things. I have a, a passage, Matthew chapter 13. Let's go over there real quickly. And uh, verses 45 and uh, 46. <coughs> Matthew 13, 45 and 46, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and he sold all that he had and bought it. So the kingdom of heaven, of heaven is like that. That you want to seek it so much that you're willing to give up everything else to make sure that you have the things of God. What are you saying? Pastor, you say, I need to sell my house, my cow, and my, my sheep, and my dog. And, no, you keep your dog. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to seek him and the things of God as though you're seeking after the most rarest item that will set you up for the rest of your life. Because it will. When you get a hold of the things of God, it will set you up for the rest of your life. And then it says knock. We need to knock as, as one wanting to enter the house of a friend, like you're in need. Maybe, maybe you need a loaf of bread because your uh, grandkids showed up. And so you go over to the neighbor's house and you knock on the door at 2 o'clock in the morning because your grandson's hungry and wants some bread. And, uh, and so you knock on the door and, and your neighbor says, go away, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. But you know you got to get some bread for that grandson. So what do you do? You keep knocking until finally that neighbor gets up. And whether they're irritated or not, they come to the door and you say, can I have some bread? In order to get you to leave, they give you some bread. <laughs> or, or out of the goodness of their heart, one or two. In Luke chapter 11, we read a, a story about that. Um, this is all right out of the Bible, isn't that? Yeah. Luke chapter 11, verse 5. It says, And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight? And say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, don't trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are, are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you to eat. At that time, they had like one bedroom. Everybody slept. Verse 8 says, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. You can go on and read there. It talks about God only gives good things. So I guess tonight, if you get a clue that God has a plan for you, Hopefully your next step will be, God, I know you have a plan. Now help me be involved with that plan. Begin to knock. Begin to ask. Begin to seek. And say, God, I want all you have for me. And I'm not going to quit bugging you until I get it. I'll just say this tonight, that this whole thing about the illness that come on me. And we've got so many people praying I felt like I had a revelation this week that God didn't stand a chance. Because <laughs> there's so many people praying. He's going to have to heal me. Because there's so many people knocking. So many people seeking. So many people believing. It'll make a difference. And that's the way it is with all our lives. You see, I want to be what God has created me to be. I want you to be what God created you to be. I don't know what it is. Only you know that. If you seek from God, He's got gifts that He's given you to use. It, it, it may not be preaching, it may not be even going to somebody's house and telling them about Jesus. It may be who knows what it might be, but whatever it is in your life, it can be a glory to God and it can be an inspiration to someone else. And who knows, it might be that one thing that will uh, cause that one person to say, you know something, I need Jesus in my life too. And if we can all get a hold of that and say, all right, God, go ahead and run me through that narrow gate. 
Bible tells me it might be difficult. Well, it might be. I found out over these uh, 28 plus years of ministry that uh, there's some difficulties once in a while. And uh, sometimes there's not. Sometimes there is. But it's all part of it. It's all part of going through that narrow gate. Sometimes I want to turn around and rebel and run back out. Praise God, God's been right there at the end. wouldn't let me do it. He got the whip out and the hot shot. <laughs> he pushed me right back down the gate. And, uh, and it works. So I guess I want to close with that tonight. That last scripture, ask, seek, and knock, until you find out what God has for you. And I promise you, it'll be good. Because if you ask for bread, He's not going to give you a snake, the Bible says. The ask for bread is going to give you bread. God's not going to give you bad things. He's going to give you good things. Let's close with that. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the time we've had here tonight. I thank you for each and every one that's here. Lord, I know we have one more part of this series next week. And uh, we'll go through it. But Lord, more than anything, I pray that you get a hold of us somehow. Help us to understand that we were created for something good. We may not know it, we may rebel against it from time to time, but somehow, Lord, plan in our hearts that we want to be what you created us to be. Because, Lord, time is short. And, and there are people out there that, that need to see that, that we can be what you created us to be, that we can follow you and, and we can enjoy it. And yeah, there'll be some tough times. But there'll be good times too. And Lord, that's what we want. So we submit to you tonight. Our heads bowed and eyes closed real quickly. I want to ask if anybody's here tonight and you've not committed your life to Jesus and, and you want me to pray for you, I'm not going to, you know, it's hard to come down here, but just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. Anybody at all that says, I want to make sure I'm right with Jesus and uh, I'll pray with you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to close out. Father, tonight I thank you for each and every one that's here. They're all such a blessing. Lord God, the, the things that they've already done, the love they've poured out, it amazes me, Lord God. And so I know that we have an amazing group of people that are being what you created them to be. And so, Lord, we yield ourselves to you and we ask you to continue working in our lives in this way. So we can bring glory to you. Maybe see some more folks come to know you like we do, Father. Bless each and every one this week. Bless them real good. Bless them everything they put their hands to, Lord. And Father, if there's decisions that they need help with, help them with decisions. If, if there's relationship issues that come up, help them with that, Lord God. If there's a, an illness that comes up, heal them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Whatever, whatever they need, Lord God, I'm asking that you would provide it. And we'll be sure to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And before you leave, make sure you tell somebody you're going to be praying for them this week. And then do it. God bless you.